including stars to determine the expansion rate of the universe as part of the Hubble Space Telescope Key Project on the extra galactical distance scale for which the team was awarded the 2009 Gruber Prize in Cosmology. I must admit I don't know of the Gruber Prize. Is that a Canadian? No, that's a um, from the Peter Gruber Foundation, these multi-billionaires who set up a kind of a a Nobel Prize, if you like, for astronomy and astrophysics. Um, unfortunately, I did not get to share in the million dollar prize. Uh, oh. That went to the uh, the senior grown-ups on the project, which is still a bone <laughs> of contention with the postdocs who are attached to the project doing the research, but we won't go into that. Sorry, I brought you too. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so with your, with your PhD students, Brad also discovered the first evidence that our own Milky Way nearest, Milky Way's nearest neighbors are being cannibalized by our galaxy, being ripped apart by intense tidal forces. Brad's work has been acknowledged by his peers 20,000 times, making him Hull's most cited academic and one of the top few percent in the world. His 300 papers to date also include the identification of the locations within the Milky Way most likely to harbour complex biological life, for which his work was named by the National Geographic magazine as one of the top 10 news stories of the year. His recent work has been in trying to link his expertise in galactic chemical evolution with complex cosmological hydrodynamical schemes in order to model the time evolution of the chemical and dynamical properties of the Milky Way. So if you can please put your hands together uh, in a Mexborough and Swinton Society way and welcome Professor Brad Gibson. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -oh, that's very nice. <laughs> I have not seen that done before yet in Zoom. That's fantastic. <laughs> Slightly bewildering seeing all the hands going yeah. across the screen, mind you. <laughs> it's it's better than just hearing one person clapping. <laughs> Having little little digital claps. No, I appreciate it um, uh, very very much. Uh, I am going to attempt to share my screen, and at the same time, thank you very much for having me back again. I had a fantastic time. I guess it was two years ago uh, when I was last there. Let's see if this works. And I had a wonderful time, even if I did have to cut it short a little bit. Um, I don't know if I can figure out how to... Okay, is, does that look okay? Okay, um, so this is a, a bit of a history lesson for me as well. I started my undergraduate degree way back in, I guess it was the early 80s in physics. Hadn't really given a whole lot of thought as to what I was going to do when I finished my undergraduate degree, but as I got towards the end of it, decided that astronomy, astrophysics was the direction I wanted to go. And I started to shop around a little bit, think about what sort of work I might want to do when I go into postgraduate research. And around the same time, so I would have been but, uh, looking into this about late 87, early 88, I, there was an article in Scientific American about the search for extrasolar planets. And uh, this was right at the very beginning of the exoplanet search game, which has sort of uh, dominated astronomy and astrophysics over the last you know, 30 odd years or so. Um, the first techniques that were invented to detect extrasolar planets were using uh, these um, hydrogen fluoride cells that you would spread the light through spectroscopy of a star, incredibly high resolution, high spectral resolution. And then you would look for the effects on the lines of the gravity of a planet going around the star. And you would see the slight wobble of the star in these lines. Uh, so they invented this technique at the University of British Columbia. It was written up in Scientific American, again, around the time that I was thinking about where I would go do my PhD. And it really caught my attention. Being a sci-fi fan, I thought, this is great. I want to get in on the ground floor of the search for extrasolar planets. That was my plan. I went off to Vancouver in 88 to do my, my PhD. Uh, within about a, a week or so of starting it, I realized the search for extrasolar planets sounded really great in a Scientific American article, really exotic. Um, but the practicality of it was, it was it's very mathematical. It's an enormous uh, stuff trolling around in the noise of spectra. You're doing techniques called time series analysis, trying to find some evidence of these extrasolar planets. It wasn't quite as exciting as I thought it was going to be. 
Uh, and so I probably in retrospect mistakenly jumped ship and decided, no, I didn't want to get in. I didn't want to do ex exoplanets. Now looking at where the money is and where the jobs are, one could argue that was a very bad decision. Uh, I think I fared okay in the end regardless. But around the same time, an alternate project was put in front of me to develop this uh, thing called the Liquid Mirror Telescope. It was novel. Uh, the technique had been around for a while, and I'll, tell, I'll show you a little bit about the history of these LMTs, liquid mirror telescopes, in, in just a minute. Um, and it caught, it caught my fancy because it was different. It seemed exciting. It was unique. No one else was doing this uh, at the time. And I thought, yeah, this is the sort of thing I wanted to do, something that was cutting edge. And that's what I did for uh, two, two and a half years or so uh, for my, my master's project. And I'll, I'll step you through what a liquid mirror telescope is, what the pros, the cons, uh, what the applications are, and what the the dangers are associated with them as well, and where things stand uh, today, sort of over the next half hour or so. Um, just, uh, I'm not going to step through you know, the, the history of the Milne Center and where I am. Just a quick reminder for those who didn't see my talk two years ago. Yes, we're based at University of Hull. Uh, we established the the, the center, let's see if I can make this thing go. We established the center, I guess it's five, coming up on five years now. Uh, there's about 25 of us now, staff and postgraduate students. I guess next week you'll have one of our, um, uh, I, think, I can't remember if David Benoit has been there before, I believe he may have been. Uh, David will be talking about a little bit about extrasolar planets and water worlds in, in particular next week. And a couple of our postgrads, uh, Mikkel and uh, Lawrence, will be talking to you over the coming months as well about their their research. Uh, as I said, we've sort of gone from zero to twenty five in uh, we've reached sort of steady state right now in terms of the the research component of of the center. Now, what new has uh, occurred in the sort of the intervening two years since I was last with you? Um, we had our as I say the center is named after Arthur Milne. Uh, he was born and raised in, in Hull, uh, was a contemporary of Einstein, had his own alternate theories of cosmology, and I won't go into, I talked a little bit about that last time I was there. Uh, we had um, Arthur's, can you see my cursor as well? Yeah, so we had Arthur's daughter and granddaughter up not too long ago, pre-lockdown to have the unveiling of the plaque on, on the building where the Milne Center is based. Uh, it's my PhD student, Leah, who's doing some amazing work and probably in a year's time, you'll want to get her to come and give a talk on the work that she's doing. She's part of the team doing the, the largest computational astrophysics simulation ever conducted before, the first results of which have just come out in the last week or two, but she'll have some great science to talk about in a, in a year's time. Uh, a big part, and I, I know I talked a little bit about this when I was here last time, but a big part of what we've been doing over the last few years is trying to uh, widen our participation, our diversity. Uh, the focus over the last couple of years has been on gender diversity. Uh, we've had um, a fairly ambitious uh, internship work experience scheme running over the last few years. We take 10 to 12 students per, per year from around the region. Uh, we go into 30 or 40 schools and colleges uh, each year uh, and sort of try to provide opportunities and engage with not just, not just women, um, but diversity in its broadest sense. And that includes uh, socioeconomic. So a lot of our focus has been on regions and schools and colleges, um, sometimes often forgotten, if you like, in the grand scheme of things and trying to provide opportunities to, for students to come in and, and take, take on a sort of world leading um, high intensity research projects. Uh, over the last two years, we've managed, we've doubled the number of women into physics at Hull, and again, from a very low base, but uh, the sorts of things that we were starting when I was there last time in March 2018, I think I was there with you, uh, sort of come to fruition with the, the doubling of the number of women into, into physics, which is uh, probably the thing we're most proud of, I guess, over the last couple of years would be that, that outcome. Uh, what we have done during that period, there's this thing, um, was recognized by the, uh, the UK's um, Equality Challenge Unit. Uh, it was named best practice in the country. I guess it was uh, December 2018 and uh, was awarded this Athena Swan bronze medal for the, this particular project that we've been running. 
Uh, if you are a teacher, I may have said something about this when I was there last time, if you are a teacher, a governor, grandparent, parent of students, it uh, doesn't matter whether it's ages from early years, four year old up through college. Uh, as I say, we get into any school and college that contacts us that wants someone to come in. If it's young kids, we may come in and talk about you know, astronauts and life in space. It could be stuff about careers in physics. It can be the search for alien life, whatever the, the case may be. Typically, I, I take uh, some of the young women who've been really instrumental in this changing face of physics campaign to come along, talk about their experiences, uh, fantastic sort of peer role models, and the, the increase in the number of women into physics uh, is largely due, I think, to the, the role that each of them have played in coming into schools and colleges and talking about their experiences, because they come from the same socioeconomic backgrounds, the same issues that they're facing, they faced three, four, five years ago. Uh, when they were making decisions about what they were going to do. So uh, it's non-scientific, but it's one of the big things that has developed over the last two years since I was uh, visiting you. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say in terms of the preamble. So come back to, um, actually I don't need to worry about that. Let's come back. Oh. A cylindrical piece of glass or ceramic with low thermal expansion. The blank is ground so Can that the it? optical surface has the correct curvature. This is by far the biggest chunk of work. The optical surface is then polished to be very smooth. Lastly, a reflective aluminum coating is applied. In the early 1980s, Stewart Observatory Mirror Lab at the University of Arizona began using the technique of spin casting. This involves creating the mirror blank in nearly the correct parabolic shape in a spin caster that is a combination of oven and mirror ground. Chunks of glass similar to Pyrex are heated in the device and once molten are rotated at a precisely calculated rate. Centrifugal forces produce a parabolic shape and then the mirror blank is cooled and allowed to solidify while still rotating. This greatly reduces the labor needed to grind the mirror into the final correct parabolic shape. The following demonstration is useful for conveying how spin casting works. It consists of a thin rectangular tank, think fish tank, that is mounted on an electric motor that will allow it to rotate. A liquid is needed to represent liquid glass and we will use water with a little green food coloring for visibility. Imagine that there is a built-in furnace and temperature will be conveyed by a red glow. We can think of this as a slice of the normal spin casting process. We begin spin casting at room temperature with no rotation. Our glass is a rectangular slab. We then raise the temperature until the glass becomes molten and then turn on the rotation. Note that our liquid quickly assumes a parabolic shape. Now turn off the heat and allow the glass to slowly cool and solidify. Sorry, that started before I had a chance for a preamble. So, the, you know, this is one of the um, clever inventions from Stewart Observatory in, in Arizona a couple of decades ago, trying to come up with a cheaper way to grind large mirrors into the appropriate shape, at least into a, a perfect parabolic shape. And this spin casting, it's not the only way that we make mirrors nowadays. And if you look at very large telescopes, like uh, the very large telescope, uh, ESO, uh, the Keck telescope, they're actually made out of segments rather than large monolithic mirrors. But large monolithic mirrors, this is the, um, the cheap way to get a nice, perfect parabolic shape. And once you've got the solidified uh, borosilicate glass, then you cover it with a, you know, the thin layer of uh, aluminum or aluminum to give it that reflectivity. And that's how the classical large monolithic mirrors are are constructed. And so liquid mirror telescopes basically build on the sort of physics that goes into constructing the, that spin casting technique that was just described for, for Stewart. So this is what it looks like. Uh, you have a, a, a mirror over here where you have liquid mercury just sitting in it. You start it spinning. The only forces that are at play are gravity, which is downwards, and as you start spinning it, you get this, what's called a centrifugal force that tries to force the liquid outwards. And the, you know, the, the simple mathematics of it has been, it was elegantly laid out by Newton back in the 1600s in Principia. When you have gravity pointed straight down and a centrifugal force going out like that, you naturally take any rotating fluid naturally takes the shape of a, par of a parabola. So if you want a mirror to be a parabola, this is a very simple, elegant way. If you can spin something at, and keep that rate at the right rate, you have a perfect parabola at all times. And so you can imagine you, know, you could do this with liquid work, with liquid water. It is reflective. It's not going to be a great mirror because you know, 
liquid water is not 100% reflective, a lot of it refracts and goes into it. But if you use a highly reflective liquid like liquid mercury, then you've got your cheap, simple mechanical, if you like, way of constructing uh, what could be potentially a very large monolithic mirror. And I'll show you how this works in practice, practice uh, not just in principle, but in, in practice. Uh, you can sort of see in the animation over to the side here, um, I'm scared to move my mouse too much, but oh, over here, as you start to spin it, it's slow, and you saw it in the animation, it starts flat, and then it starts to slowly take the, the parabolic shape. If you spin faster and faster and faster, the, parabol the parabola gets steeper and steeper and steeper, if you like. So you have a perfect parabola, but depending on how fast you spin it, you can change the, the F ratio of your mirror. You spin it slow, you get a long focal length, you spin it fast, you get a short focal length. I'll show you the, the mirror that I built for my masters uh, towards the end. Okay, so that's the basic physics involved. Um, so where does liquid mercury actually come from? Uh, I'll show you two different ways of, of gathering liquid mercury to put onto your, onto your mirror. Uh, we use liquid mercury because it's, re it's reasonably reflective. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the reflectivity in just a second and how it compares with the sort of traditional mirrors that you would use. First off, where does liquid mercury come from? Well, it usually comes from an ore like this. Uh, you might know it as cinnabar. Um, nowadays, almost all, something close to, I think more than 80% of the world's uh, liquid mercury comes from China. Uh, if you went back in time 20 years ago, it probably was Australia was the largest producer. Uh, that's more or less been banned uh, now. Uh, liquid mercury has been used in all kinds of things from uh, bearings to, you know, in your teeth, if you've got old fillings like me, amalgams, you've probably got liquid mercury inside of your, inside of your mouth. Uh, there's various rules coming into play with uh, the EU, and even, even through Brexit, there's various amendments to the EU regulations to, in, to basically to wind down the use of liquid mercury in any of its forms, including, you know, fluorescent light bulbs and places like that. Um, the interesting thing, one of many, there's a lot of interesting things about liquid mercury its reflectivity, its density, its price. But first, just its its density. It's very, very heavy. So if you pick up a you know a pint of beer, if you if we were in the pub right now, you you pick up a pint of beer. You know, it weighs on the order of say you know half a pound or something is what your your pint of beer weighs like. Now, if you had a pint of liquid mercury, it weighs about seventeen pounds. So it's very, very dense, very, very heavy. And as you start to imagine, if you want to coat a mirror. Uh, that is rotating with liquid mercury, you can start to add on an enormous amount of weight onto your mirror by adding uh, even a relatively thin layer. And again, I'll come back to some of the numbers towards the end, but that's just something to bear in mind. It's very dense, very heavy, 17 pounds per pint in terms of the weight. Now, where I showed you where you get it from in, in a mining sense. You, from this cinnabar, you, you, you take this ore, you put it in an oven, heat it up, the liquid merc the, the mercury, which is, you know, mercury sulfide inside of the rock uh, that uh, vaporizes inside the oven. And then once you've vaporized all that, you turn the oven off and it condenses and you basically catch all the liquid. And that's how we get liquid mercury from these, from these cinnabar. Um, it is highly toxic, as we'll come back to in a second. Uh, up until the 1950s, uh, in, in China, all of the mining was done with uh, prisoners uh, because it was recognized that it was a highly dangerous Thing. So uh, some of you um, may have memories of lab demonstrators in school decades ago sitting around playing with liquid mercury around with their hands and all, all those sorts of fun things you can do with liquid mercury. Uh, highly frowned upon nowadays um, and certainly the Chinese government in terms of the mining uh, practices were fully aware how dangerous it was up until the, up until the 50s. Uh, that's no longer the case that the prisoners are used for mining it even in China. Okay, so um, that's, oh, I guess, yeah, maybe I will say something about the reflectivity right now. So this is a, looks like a fairly busy plot. Along the bottom is two years of time. And along here is what percentage of the light reflects off of a freshly illuminized mirror. This is a four meter telescope in Chile at CTIO. And the, you know, the different colors correspond to different wavelengths. Um, this is sort of the, 
the blue part of the optical spectrum, this is sort of the red part of the opt optical spectrum. The main point being when you freshly illuminize a mirror, you get ballpark around 90% of the light gets reflected when it hits the surface, 10% uh, is not. So that's a pretty high reflectivity. It degrades with time for lots of different reasons, various oxidation, dust, junk, you know, anything that gets stuck to the surface. And it drops down to maybe 80, after about two years, if you leave a mirror untouched, it drops down to about 80% reflectivity. So you lose about 10% of the light uh, just through the, the natural degradation. And that's sort of the time scale that the large professional telescopes um, do their cleaning where they go through and then, you know, would bring it back up to 90%. Uh, liquid mercury is not as reflective as aluminium. Its reflectivity would be down here. It's about 80% in, in the optical. The good thing about liquid mercury though, is it never degrades. It stays at 80% all the time. Now it can degrade, and I'll talk about it in a, in a minute, but things like dust, um, things like bugs that land in the surface and get stuck because of surface tension and get puckered down on it and then scattered light goes off of the, off of the bugs. Um, so you can, you can degrade the reflectivity of liquid mercury, but the good thing about it is you can stop it spinning in the morning, take a skimmer and take all of the bugs and dust off the top and then spin it back up again. So it always stays at, at 80%. So you, you do pay a price in losing maybe 10% compared to freshly illuminized professional mirrors, but it doesn't degrade with time. So, you know, it's a trade-off. So that's a, that's a good part. Now, let's see, where is that one? Where do you actually get it? Um, yes, you can go out and get cinnabar, and if you've got an appropriate oven, you can do the process of vaporizing the mercury, mercury sulfide, and then condensing it to get it. Or what you do is you go online, and you go to, you just Google you know, liquid mercury. You can buy it from many different sites. This is just one that I, I looked up recently, this novaelements.com. Now, this is only two grams in a small little ampule, about 45 euros when I, when I did this uh, screen grab. Now, if you expand that out to that single pint glass that weighs 17 pounds, it works out to about 150,000 pounds per pint of liquid mercury. So try, just try and remember that, that sort of number. So it's, it's not cheap. Uh, it's, um, it is very, very expensive if you buy it. You, now, you can buy it more industrial grade mercury that's not maybe quite as pure, and you can buy it in bulk to reduce the price. But you're still looking at a very, you know, that sort of 100,000, 150,000 pounds per pint to buy it fresh and new, if you like. Now, this was not something when I was doing my master's project that we had a budget for. It was impossible to do that. The main point of doing this liquid mirror telescope experiment largely was, could we build a large professional class telescope in the two to three meter diameter, but at a fraction of the cost of what it would have been to build the traditional glass and aluminized uh, mirror which would have been on the order of um, you know, millions of millions of pounds to to build that uh, just just the mirror so could we do it with uh, you know in someone's backyard at a fraction of the cost that was the big hope with the liquid mirror telescope now we would never would have been able to realize that if we had to go to a company like this and pay 100 grand uh, per pint now the way we got around that uh, this was again what would have been late probably early, eight, late 89 when I was going to, to get the liquid mercury, is that you find, you know, this is 30 years ago, risk assessments and occupational health and safety standards at the university were somewhat lacking. And so what I was instructed to do by my supervisor at the time was take one of the university vehicles and he sent me to an industrial state, an estate outside of Vancouver at 3 a.m. with a departmental truck and I opened up the truck when I got there. <clears throat> Some people came out uh, with large pallets of little pint-sized containers of liquid mercury, put it in the back of the truck. No words were exchanged, no money was exchanged. Uh, I, all I was doing apparently in retrospect, what I know now was helping a company that didn't want to pay the money to have the mercury disposed of and cleaned uh, professionally and just handed it off to to me, unbeknownst, you know, what I was doing, really, um, I should have questioned why I was being sent at 3 a.m. to collect uh, this liquid mercury. It was a little bit dirty. It had been used in bearings. It wasn't highly contaminated, but it, it was contaminated enough 
with grit and stuff that it wasn't useful as a bearing lubricant. But for our purposes, it was totally fine. So I collected, it was something like 30 or 40 pints of this. So the, you know, the, the value of a given 150,000 pounds now per pint, you know, you're looking at probably five or 6 million pounds if I bought them new from novaelements.com, uh, all got for free. Uh, the university did catch wind of it sort of about five years after I finished my PhD. Um, there was an investigation, nothing happened because enough time had passed by but it was clear you would not get away with this in the current uh, climate of health and safety and risk assessments. But that's how, my, that's how we got the um, 30 or 40 pints of mercury that I'll, I'll show you in just a, you know, a few more minutes. Now there are some alternatives. Um, people have spent some time thinking a little bit of what could you replace liquid mercury with? Because liquid mercury, A, it's expensive, B, it's hard to get, C, it's nasty stuff. Uh, the mercury vapors are very dangerous, as I'll again come back to in just a second. So people have thought about alternatives uh, like gallium and what they call eutectic alloys of gallium. So eutectic just means, well, if you took ga pure gallium, for example, it's highly reflective, which, and it's not dangerous in the same way that liquid mercury is. The problem is gallium only is a, its melting point is 30 degrees Celsius. So yes, if you were, you know, on the equator in a really hot place where 30 or 40 degrees, yes, you could use liquid gallium, uh, not probably the best site for a professional grade telescope. But if you take something like gallium and indium, indium doesn't melt, you know, it's melting points 160 degrees Celsius. So both of them independently look like they would be terrible. But if you mix gallium and indium and tin into what's called a eutectic alloy, then the melting point is minus 20 degrees Celsius. And that's all they, what we mean when we say eutectic, you take individual elements, put them together, and the melting point is much lower than any of the individual melting points. Uh, so that would work. It wouldn't be dangerous. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't to solve the problem of the cost. Eutectic, these sort of eutectic gallium alloys are crazy expensive. If you, so uh, you, you could improve the safety aspect of liquid mercury, um, but you, you pay a price quite literally in replacing liquid mercury with uh, eutectic gallium, which is even more expensive than, than liquid mercury. So let's just look a little bit at the, the history of liquid mirror telescopes. The concept uh, can be traced back to mid 1850s. I mean, the math I mentioned already, the maths you can trace back to, to Newton in the 1600s, uh, but it wasn't until a few letters that were written by uh, a Vatican astronomer, Nesta Capocci in the 18, 1850 or so, where the, he explored, at least in theory, in the concept of a liquid, you know, using some reflective liquid to construct a telescope that would allow you to study the sky. Um, there was no, I had friends in the Vatican who looked through all of his personal memoirs. There's no evidence that he actually took that theory into, into the practical world and actually constructed one. Uh, the first one that was really built and well documented was a, an English astronomer, Henry Skye, who moved to New Zealand in 1870s. Uh, he built a you know, roughly no, be about a foot in in diameter uh, mirror in the lab. Uh, didn't do any science or astronomy with it. Just demonstrated that it could actually rotate some liquid mercury in a 12-inch dish and get something that sort of took an image of what was on the on the roof or on the ceiling. The first one that uh, was used for astronomical purposes, uh, Robert Wood in uh, 1908. Uh, he built a half meter telescope out in the field. This was, uh, it's kind of interesting if you uh, are interested in sort of uh, the history of science. If you go back and read his paper from 1908, where he uh, describes the, the construction of the, the telescope um, and the, the transport of it out to his farm in the countryside in upstate New York, it's a fascinating read because it it doesn't read like a professional scientific paper. You would never get away with it nowadays where everything is very cold and mechanical and the wording. It, it's much, much more of a sort of a travel log. Uh, it talks about the weather as he's driving from, you know, um, from New York City out to upstate New York. So it's a, it's a really enjoyable, engaging read. Uh, there aren't any photographs, but there's lots of um, artwork in there. And I'll show you a picture of his setup for his half meter telescope uh, built in his farm. And then there's more or less a, a big gap up until the early 80s. 
and it was uh, Hermano Bora, an astronomer in Canada in Quebec City at Laval University, who picked up on this concept of the LMT and spent the next probably 15 years or so of his career really focused on trying to take this from these you know these half-hearted attempts that have been done to to construct an LMT and make them a really viable practical telescope uh, I probably should have said right at the very beginning you can probably when, it, when you see the first animation you can start to see one of the problems you rotate a liquid it makes a be beautiful parabola and that's fine for looking straight up but even if you're rotating a liquid and you decide there's something over there you know over on this over here that you want to look at it doesn't work you know if you're rotating a liquid and you turn it it spills. So it's very limited in the sense that you've got one place to look and that's at Zenith and that's it. There's nowhere else you can look. Uh, so it is limited. It's not good for looking at object X or object Y. It's great for doing surveys of what passes over through the Zenith. So if, all you're, if you're interested in characterizing stars or galaxies and quasars in a statistical sense, that's the sort of tool that a liquid mirror telescope um, is perfect for, for doing these, these sorts of problems. It's not good for studying an object X, Y, or Z in any other random direction. Um, so, but turning that into this concept into something that is practical and usable was what got Hermano Bora excited. And it's where we came in in 88 um, with my project, which was really taking what Bora had started in Quebec and taking it one step further and having an actual working functional observatory uh, out in the field. So there's a few, a comment here on one of the, uh, it's not really weird, but one of the thing, one of the limitations of a liquid mirror telescope is it's liquid, so you can only look straight up. And there's not much you can do to get around that. Um, in, in the questions, we can talk about some ways to open up the field of view uh, a little bit more with an LMT. But there are some weird things that you do have to think about when you have a liquid reflective surface. Now, one of them is, the curvature of the Earth. Now, I mentioned right at the very beginning, the, the whole concept is based on gravity, the fi gravitational field lines coming straight down and centrifugal forces pushing you out. Now, if we lived in, if we did live in a flat Earth, as some people might suggest, uh, that would be great. You would have a, the gravitational field lines would always be straight down, no matter how far you went out in any direction. Now, with a, because we live on a curved surface, the gravitational field lines as you get to a bigger and a bigger and bigger telescope the gravitational field lines instead of being parallel to each other at the edge they start to be a little a little bit off from each other so the gravitational field is a little bit different at the edge than it is in the center and what that means is that it introduces a tiny bit of spherical aberration into your mirror it's very small if you had exquisite measuring equipment you could and, and a very large mirror probably probably the 50 meters or so in size, you could uh, elegantly disprove any flat earthers theory uh, because you would get this uh, very distinctive spherical aberration that would come into your, your parabolic mirror, into your images. Uh, you have to, because it's a liquid, you have to worry about tides. So you have to worry about where the moon is um, because as the moon's going around, it's gonna tug a little bit differently on the surface, this liquid surface. Again, it's not a big effect, but in a very exquisite observing site, you know, that, that the fraction of an arc second level, you would get coma induced by where the moon is in its orbit around the earth at any given time. Uh, the bigger issue though is uh, Coriolis force. And what that really means, you can think of Coriolis force as kind of in what it's, what's drawn here. You can, you can imagine an object that is firing, you know, in an, what you think is in a, a nice straight line as you move uh, you know, if you like, from the equator upwards. But as you know, we're on a sphere. It's rotating. What that means is that at the equator, if you were standing on the edge measuring how fast you're moving, it's about a thousand miles per hour. As you move up to the pole, you know, it's basically stationary, so it's not rotating at all. So depending on what latitude you're at and where we sit at 53 degrees or so, you're rotating at, you know, about 600 miles per hour. That's roughly our rotation speed. But you can see it varies with latitude. So if you have a big enough mirror, the latitude at the north end of your mirror is a, a little bit um, more positive than the latitude at the south end of your mirror. And what that means is the south end of your mirror and the north end of your mirror, they're feeling 
a differential rotation of the earth because it's not moving at exact. So it's, it may be rotating at, you know, five miles an hour or something, the, the mirror, but at the North bit and the South bit, they're actually moving a little bit different. And the difference is very small, but it's about works out for a 10 meter class mirror. It's about one millimeter per second difference is the rotation speed at the North part of the mirror and the South part of the mirror. And that, difference in the rotation speed it, if it was a solid mirror it wouldn't matter it would just keep moving it, would, it wouldn't care but because it's liquid the liquid responds to this Coriolis force differently and that introduces both astigmatism and coma and for a 10 meter class telescope it's pretty significant at least for a mirror that is sitting at um, sort of mid mid latitude range it's of that order of five to ten arc seconds so it's quite large much larger typically than the seeing certainly in a and a really good observational site where the scene might be, you know, a couple tens, few tens of an arc second or something, half an arc second. This is much larger than the seeing disk. So all of your images would have astigmatism and coma if you took this telescope and did that. Now, you can fix it, of course. If you know which latitude you're at, you know how big the astigmatism and the coma is due to Coriolis force. And so you design a corrector lens that fixes that. Now, you couldn't take that mirror and move it any, any other latitude because you'd have to design a new corrector lens but you could fix it, but it's a, it's a large part of the cost. And again, this would sort of get away from the, the advantage of what we were trying to prove with a liquid mirror telescope, that you could build a large telescope and keep it cheap. Now, where we built our telescope in based my supervisor's backyard in Vancouver, uh, the seeing is terrible. And so, you know, we, and it, the telescope is only two and a half meters in, in diameter. So the level of astigmatism and coma is smaller than the seeing. So our images look, nice when I show you a picture, but underlying them, there is this astigmatism and coma that you can't get away from simply because the Coriolis force is, is real. Again, another nice proof that, you know, we're not on a, a flat earth. Um, another thing that makes them a little bit more challenging than a typical telescope, and like I said, you, they point in one direction and you can't track. So you can't move, you know, you can't look at something and track it. So that means by definition, if you didn't do anything, everything would look like this. You would have star trails. Now, if you were right on the equator, maybe that wouldn't be so bad because the stars would go right along the columns of your CCD. And if you're right at the pole, you can imagine it would be really bad because everything would just be rotating around in little circles on, a, on, on your CCD. And as you move to lower and lower latitudes, you know, those little circles start to break up into curved arcs. And again, where we built our telescope uh, in Vancouver, you get something like this, the star trail cut across. And for the CCD that we were using at the time, what that meant was it would, it would traverse, you know, two or three pixels. Now, it doesn't matter that there or there or there. What it means is that all the images all have a, you know, they're all skewed to one side, they get, they get stretched to one side towards the north in, in this case. Again, you could create a corrector to fix that. Um, the way, um, you know, again, if you had a normal telescope, you would obviously be tracking. You would just move your telescope along the arc and you would be accumulating image, your, your counts, photon counts will be coming into your CCD as you, as you move along. Again, you can't track, so the star moves across the CCD what you can do so you don't get trails and arced trails is you clock the CCD at the sidereal rate. So in this, in our case, we had, it took about two minutes for the, for a star to cross the CCD. And so we just read out the CCD at the sidereal rate. And so what you get is effectively a two minute integration. And if you had clear nights for 10 hours, you would get an image that was 10 hours long and two minutes exposure time. So again, it's not great for looking at any particular object in the sky, but if all you're looking at is large survey areas and doing counting statistics, then that's totally fine. And if you really cared about image quality, you would build your telescope as close to the equator as possible to minimize the star trails, or you have to design a corrector to take into account the fact that everything is curved as it goes across. But this is just one of the things you have to, to deal with. Again, because of this site that we built the telescope in, this wasn't particularly problematic uh, because the seeing was so bad where we were, where we were doing it. Uh, other things you have to worry about, let's see, you've got a liquid 
you know, for the telescope that I'm talking about uh, in a second, about two and a half meters in diameter, 2.7 meters in diameter, uh, it was a an, roughly an F2. So you know, focal length was, you know, five and a half meters or so, something like that. Uh, what that meant is that the, it, if you walked briskly, it's about three miles an hour at the edge of the mirror as it goes around, it's about three miles an hour. So you could sort of walk around as it's going. Now, if you have a still, still air around you, what that means is that relative to the liquid mercury, there's wind blowing across it at sort of three miles per hour. And what that means is you get these things that uh, sailors would call uh, cat's paw, these flickering little ripples that you see as wind blows, you know, sheer across the surface will induce these little ripples, these cat's paws, um, they're called wind-driven capillary waves is the technical optics term. And you get exactly that sort of thing. You know, if you take a, a very quick snapshot of a liquid mirror telescope, you see these little ripples that are in place. Now you can try to minimize them by doing lots of things. You can put a transparent layer of mylar over top of your telescope and so that the air inside is rotating at the same speed as the, the liquid. And then, then you don't get these capillary waves that are coming on. Um, it's just one of the things that you have to, to deal with and think about when you're working with a liquid mirror telescope. Uh, how do you actually build one? So I, I put a lot of negative things into it. Um, and, you know, so what, but let's regard, you know, disregard all the negative things, all the things that complicate. Um, why are we going to build one? I mentioned it right away. We want to do it cheap. Now, my supervisor, he was really into build, building, he, um, he had a, a really well equipped um, uh, garage that had all kinds of you know industrial equipment. He built his own private plane using you know high density professional grade styrofoam that you cut into appropriate shapes. He had all the equipment to uh, to melt and wrap Kevlar and carbon fiber around the surface. And you know this, and this is exactly the premise that went into the liquid mirror telescope. We had all the equipment. The good thing about the equipment is it's only about ten thousand pounds to Built to get to buy the um, the foam, the high density styrofoam that use is the interior of the mirror cell. Again, picture this is roughly about three meters in diameter, so you're looking, you know, across one and a half meters or so in radius. Uh, you have these. Um, we had eight segments of, of of high density styrofoam that were glued together. You use a hot wire to cut off the bottom uh, and to drag a hot wire along the top to give you a rough parabolic shape. You glue these eight segments together, you wrap it with multiple layers of, of Kevlar, um, puts, and then you mount it on this base plate, and you, it's a frictionless air bearing, and you rotate it at the rate you want, to, want it to have for the appropriate F ratio, and then we pour um, this epoxy resin on the surface and do a, effectively a spin cast, much like I showed you right in the very first movie, but with this epoxy resin and it settles into a nice parabolic shape, which is, okay, it's not a perfect mirror and it, but it's, you know, it's good to, you know, a small fraction of a, you know, maybe to a millimeter, half a millimeter or so in terms of quality. So you've got a nice parabolic base to build on. And that's effectively all that goes into a, the construction and let's say all the material uh, was about 10,000, well, ten thousand dollars. So you know, whatever, seven or eight thousand pounds, probably something like that. So incredibly cheap, probably a factor of, you know, you know, a factor of a thousand cheaper than what a, maybe not a thousand, but it's certainly a factor of a, a few hundred cheaper than what the equivalent glass and aluminized mirror would would have cost. So that was the you know that was the big selling point. You could just knock it off in your backyard with a you know, that's sort of a 10K investment, you could build a three meter class. And that's that it, other than the labor attached to it, that's that's all it really cost. Um, you wanted to, you know, again, the point was minimizing the cost. You want to minimize the weight because this is all sitting on top of this base plate. Now, the styrofoam and the Kevlar and all that, it's not particularly heavy. So that's not a problem. Uh, but you need to have as many layers of Kevlar as possible because you want to minimize the flexure because it's sitting on this plate. So if you put on this liquid mercury, which I said is very heavy, uh, it ends up flexing downwards. And it's not the end of the world because you just put more liquid mercury on and it will eventually take, it'll always take the shape of a parabola. It might be thinner mercury layer here than here if it flexes too much, but you're just trying to minimize the weight, minimize the flexure so you can minimize the amount of liquid mercury that you have to put on 
so you have your reflective surface. Um, for that, for our telescope, uh, maybe I'll show you in just a second. Uh, first, just the just a quick drawing of what the the first observatory, if you like, looked like. Uh, this is from Robert Wood's paper in 1909. This is upstate New York. He's got a a barn that he's cut a. Uh, you know, this is his um, his slit, if you like, for the the telescope. He's got the liquid mirror down at the bottom. I can't. This is the half meter diameter. Uh, he doesn't have frictionless air bearings that that spin the. It sits on top of a bearing, but it's a mechanical bearing, so there's jitter and shake. So that gives you ripples and things on the surface that you need to to worry about. Uh, and then an entry entrance shaft uh, over here on the side. It it worked. Uh, he was able to resolve. I think it's epsilon epsilon lyrae, which is they're about um, five arc seconds separation. The double star. So he was able to resolve at that sort of level, sort of the, the five arc second. Again, it's not competitive with contemporary telescopes in any way, shape, or form. But he was able to sort of demonstrate the ability to get that sort of level of, of precision. Um, this is. Our telescope, uh, as I say, was built in, in the backyard of um, my supervisor. We, uh, I am the least handy person probably on earth. I didn't realize when I got into this project, I was going to have to do things um, outside of doing sort of theory and computation and data reduction and stuff like that. But in fact, I came in right you know, from zero, from scratch. It meant digging up his backyard, laying a concrete pad, um, and then building the the actual dome, the the silo, if you like. Uh, so it's about six meters high. Uh, it's about three meters, three and a half meters or so in uh, diameter. Uh, the at the top is just a basically it's a, a garage door opener. Just just opens and rolls back. Um, now the very first day that I started my masters, um, it was literally the very first day. Uh, I went down to Paul's house. As I said, he had a garage full of all kinds of tools. Uh, he and one of my first jobs was using uh, just taking large pieces of, of two by four and cutting them down into size. This was my first time using a table saw, and. It probably, again, he never asked me if I knew how to use a table saw. Um, it looked like it was easy. Just take wood, push it through the saw. And that part worked fine. Then, you know, the smart guy that I am goes in to grab the wood. And, you know, this whirring blade of death is going so fast that you don't even see it. And I barely felt a thing as I reached in to grab the wood and I hit, the, uh, hit it with my finger. I turned my finger very much inside out. Uh, it was quite... Terrific. So it was literally like an hour into my postgraduate research and my supervisor was rushing me to hospital to sew my finger up and put it back down. It could have been a whole lot worse, obviously. Uh, that probably should have been a clue that um, he had probably chosen the wrong student to do this particular project. Uh, I persevered. Uh, I had a, a few months where I didn't have any accidents. <clears throat> I, had, um, uh, I had another second trip to the hospital when we were doing this uh, painting. And we had one of the one of the ladders went right out of the top, and again, it was a piece of two by four wood that was resting on the top of the ladder. I got down on the ground and I went over and grabbed the ladder and went to shift it. The two by four that was sitting six meters up fell down and landed on my head and For the second time, I was rushed off the hospital to sew my head back up this was um this was just weeks before I was getting married, so there were no pictures from the wedding from behind. Um, that really did seal the deal that I was not going to stay in instrumentation for my PhD and decided once I'd finished my master's project, I was going to move back to the relative safety of theory and computation and work on the data analysis software that, um, that would be attached to the telescope. But I had sort of done my duty at that point in time. Didn't need any more hospital trips. This was not what I had uh, signed up for. Um, so that, but regardless, we did actually build a telescope. Uh, this is what it looks like. It's 2.7 meters in diameter. They're really amazing. Um, when you stand right beside them, it just looks like a perfect mirror. Now, if you block out the fact that, you know, you've got the, you know, it's going on, you've got something going around the edge and you, you can see the edge sort of moving the, the metal ring that holds all the liquid mercury in, if you like. But if you sort of block that out of your view and just look at the mirror, I mean, it just looks like a perfect mirror. There's, you can't tell it's rotating. It is just an absolute perfect, perfect mirror. And it is, 
really is perfect in the sense that it is um, what we call diffraction limited. You can resolve, you know, these are things that we use to measure the quality of the image. It is, you can resolve what's called the airy disk. Um, this is as good a quality mirror as the Hubble Space Telescope, at least in the lab, in terms of the, the quality of the, the image. It's diffraction limited. Now, okay, in the lab is one thing is you can isolate everything from vibrations and you can get these sort of perfect mirrors. In reality, you know, in the backyard of my supervisor's place, you've got, you know, garbage trucks going by and dump trucks and things going on that cause vibrations. And even though air bearings are pretty well isolated, there you still have sort of magnetic tape that connects the air bearing to your drive motor and you can still get vibrations translated along the, the magnetic tape that shakes the air bearing just a tiny bit. So, you, you know, you, you need to think really carefully if you're building one of these telescopes um, to do professional astronomy, you'd have to be really vibrationally isolated, which most professional observatories would be. Um, but again, the seeing in Vancouver is so bad that you didn't have to worry about that. And, and we we're just trying to demonstrate the technique rather than demonstrate it was perfect in, in that sense. Um, but, you know, that's that's sort of what we got. This is not, you know, this is 25, 26, probably 27 years ago when this was taken. This is just showing part of a very long, you know, 10-hour strip that we would have got on a particular night. And the CCD was sort of 20 by 20 arc minutes. So you're only getting, it's only two minutes. It's not particularly deep. Uh, but, you know, it gets you down to an RF-21 even in a in a terrible site. And there's no obvious coma, stigmatism or, or any uh, or skewed from the star trails going across the the chip and that just reflects the fact that the seeing is is so bad but it actually does work and you do get real observational data that you can that you can work with now our plan was each night you would use a narrow band filter that was only a few hundred angstroms if you um, in in width and you would take a 10 hour you know ignore cloud and everything else you get a 10 hour exposure one night using a narrow filter and then you do the same thing the next night using the next filter over and then the next night the next filter over and the next filter over and over the and we had 40 filters that we were going to use so you know if you had perfect weather over 40 nights you know you would build up this um, low resolution spectrum of every object in the sky so it's not high resolution like you would get with spectrograph but it would be sufficient to tell the difference between stars and galaxies and quasars and measure the redshifts, the distances to the, the various objects. So that, that was the, the plan. And that was around the time when we started to collect the first data, I, I sort of moved away from the, the observational and experimental side into the, the, the modeling and, and, and theory side. But it, does, it, it did work. Um, the, the concept of building these low resolution spectra by taking night after night after night of narrow band filters uh, it's now uh, commonly, even if liquid mirror telescopes have been taken over the world, the technique that we sort of invented to measure the redshift and categorize the, the stars, galaxies, and, and quasars uh, using these intermediate band filters has been picked up by a couple of different big surveys that are being run in Spain, at the Calor Alto Telescope, and in, um, there's a, a mirror image of it in, in Brazil as well. Uh, and there's Alhambra and JPAS of the surveys, but that's exactly what they're doing. They're on traditional normal telescopes, but the principle is the same. They scan as much of the sky as possible using a narrow band filter one night, do the same thing the next night with a different filter and so on and so on. until so they build up a low resolution spectrum of absolutely everything in the sky, not just the little strip that we were restricted to with a liquid mirror telescope. So that's sort of one legacy, positive legacy, I guess, of, of what it was that we had done. Um, just a couple things to finish up on, and that is, um, I did mention sort of the safety aspect of it. Um, it's a bit of a busy plot, but this this curve here is a measure of the mercury vapor in the air in, in milligrams per cubic meter. And what you see is, and this is as a function of time, measured over top of this uh, in the lab with a half meter mirror. And you measure, you know, the, it, when you first put the liquid mirror, the liquid mercury in place, and you measure it with a mercury sniffer, you see these values up up here and then as time goes by it drops off and drops off as well other things like the focus stabilizes as well but the mercury vapor drops off now the reason that is is that there's basically a, a thin layer there's like oxidation a, a sort of a thin layer forms on top of the mercury when it stabilizes and that actually increases the surface tension a little bit having this tiny tiny thin transparent layer of oxidation if you like um, which is 
doesn't hurt the reflectivity. Big benefit is that it really stabilizes ripples and things as well. So it allows that focus to, to stabilize, having this extra surface tension holding the, the liquid in place. Now you do have issues with things like bugs, especially when we built this telescope in the backyard at Paul Hickson's place, you have you know, bugs, mosquitoes and everything getting, and as soon as they land in that liquid, they get stuck there. And again, the liquid mercury puckers around them. And, you know, but, but the next day we would, we wouldn't do it every day, but every, every few days you would stop it and skim off all the bugs, the little mercury vacuum, if you like to, to get all the bugs off. Um, you might ask, you know, what is, you know, these numbers are sort of meaningless by themselves. If you went back to the 1970s, this was the, um, sort of the, the legal limit at the time in terms of exposure for a, a work day, 0.05 milligrams per cubic meter. So you can see that the, when you first establish, or first, you know, for the first few hours that you're working, you're well above that limit. Um, as the night progresses, it stabilizes. Now, for the most part, you're not in the silo where the telescope, you know, where the telescope actually is. So it doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. Once you've put the liquid in and you've established the surface, you know, you can step back to the control room and you don't have to worry about it. When you're in there, you're always wearing a mask. You have mercury sniffers to, to check what the levels are, but it does stabilize and drop below that limit. Nowadays, um, I looked up recently, I think it in the probably five, 10 years ago, um, they, they've reduced that limit down between 0.01 and 0.02, depending on um, which country you're in, whether it's EU, North America, World Health Organization, but the typical exposure limits are between 0.01 and 0.02 for a, an eight hour working day. So this is again, one of these, you know, one of the dangers associated with liquid mercury and mercury vapors as a whole. So to sort of wrap up, um, look, it was a good experiment. We collected some data, uh, we published some papers. Um, it got a lot of attention at the time. Um, and it certainly helped my career because I was able to publish a lot of papers, not in necessarily astronomy papers, but you know, some of the things related to the structural analysis, you know, how, much, how many layers of Kevlar do you have to put on to stop the flexure being too high? So it was more like structural engineering and some of this stuff about uh, Coriolis force, that, is, that was more sort of optical engineering rather than what I would call astronomy per se, but uh, it did lead to a lot of papers which helped me in my career. Uh, nowadays, yeah, you could build a liquid mirror telescope relatively cheap, but what has changed over the last, you know, 20, 30 years is that it's not the cost of the mirror really that's the dominant cost of these large telescopes. As we come up with clever ways to do segmented mirrors, the cost has dropped dramatically. Um, it's really more the, it's the correctors, it's the instruments attached to them, the spectrographs, the photometers, the cost of the domes are crazy, the ventilations, the, the actual mirror itself is no longer the limiting part of building a 10 meter class telescope. That's sort of that 10% level. The other 90% is all the other bits and pieces that, that come with it. So the big selling point of the LMT was, yeah, you could build a mirror really cheap, which you could, but it doesn't help you with the other 90% of the costs which is the domes and everything else that, that comes with it. So, you know, it was fun, it was cool. Um, the world didn't change in terms of liquid mirror telescopes replacing uh, glass and aluminized mirrors, but they, are, they do have a use in certain fields. And one of the fields which is still using them, and we, we actually built a couple of them, uh, University of Western Ontario for their atmospheric research. Uh, it's called LIDAR, basically you just fire lasers up, but anywhere from sort of 50 to 100 miles into the atmosphere. And you can measure the scattering, aerosol particles, uh, morphology of clouds. So if you're doing atmospheric research, you don't generally care whether you're pointing in that direction, that direction, that direction. All you really want is a light bucket to collect the reflected light from the laser after it inter inter interacts with the layer that you're interested in. So that one, uh, up until it may even still be running, but up until at least very recently, this thing had been running for like 20 years, this liquid mirror telescope that we built for them. Um, as well, we had NASA uh, caught wind of this and they were interested. They had a, in New Mexico, a big place where they do uh, basically just tracking space debris in, in Cloudcroft. They've got lots of different experiments that track space debris in different ways. And so again, they were looking for a very cheap light bucket that could, they could just point up straight in the sky. Obviously they couldn't count debris in that direction versus that direction or that direction, but they could do a statistical study just by monitoring night after night after night, how much stuff glints and picks up reflected light from the sun and so they could get a statistical handle on the amount of space junk that was that was up there 
So that got a um, reasonable amount of attention. I know if you go to the NASA page, the Cloudcroft page, where they've got their orbital debris uh, web page, um, it's been decommissioned, but there's still a several pictures and results from the the LMT that we had built them. Um, and I guess you know, I guess one thing I didn't really mention in passing these these one of the things you have to worry about, probably the most frustrating thing working with it, is you want the mercury layer to be as thin as possible because it's so heavy. You know, for this two and a half meter class, the, for the two and a half meter class one that we built, it was about 20 pints of, of mercury. So you're, you're looking at about three and a half thousand pounds in terms of weight of liquid mercury. Um, and what happens is you, you want it to be as thin as possible, but the problem is you, if you make it too thin, you get these little sucker holes that appear and the, so the surface breaks and surface tension makes the, the hole get bigger. And so you're, you pour it on, you start it spinning, and then you kind of have to lovingly caress the liquid mercury to get it to make sure that you don't get these big holes. And every time, if a hole starts to appear in the liquid mercury, you got to get in there and sort of bring it back together again and close it. So it's not as simple as just spin it up and it forms a parabola. Yeah, it would if you put you know, 10 centimeters worth of liquid mercury on there, but you want it to be as thin as possible. And it was a really nasty art trying to do this and as soon as it started to get out of control then you get the, too much weight on one side it wobbles and so this you have to be inside of this gigantic bucket in case everything really goes haywire in reality you've got little posts that sit underneath so if it does get unstable it's not going to tip all the way over but you've got this uh, this backup plan in case everything went completely pear-shaped uh you would cap catch all the uh, the liquid mercury and to end this was the the last one that was built it's a um, six meter class uh, telescope uh, moved from the backyard of Paul's house um, once the uh, university and others caught wind of what was going on. It uh, was put up into the um, one of the forests uh, that the, the university had for sort of agricultural studies. Uh, it's probably even worse than his backyard. It's, it's nestled in the mountains, partway up the mountains. So all the weather that comes in from Vancouver hits the mountains and just dumps rain there constantly. So it was more or less useless in terms of a um, telescope for astronomical purposes. But, you know, it, it worked. And up until uh, it was decommissioned maybe about two years ago as a working telescope, it's still there as kind of a museum piece. So if you are in Vancouver and you want to see the six meter class telescope, uh, then you can arrange for visits to go and see it. It's, it's, it's awe-inspiring when you see it. It's hard to imagine, but it is just this beautiful, perfect mirror that you can sort of uh, capture the essence of when you just look at the reflection there. It's a, quite an amazing achievement. Um, and I guess that's really uh, kind of an, an, an abrupt end to it. Um, so say the, the, the world didn't embrace them. Um, and uh, for a lot, you know, a lot of the reasons that I talked about, but at the end of the day, if you if it really did reduce the costs of large telescopes by an order of magnitude, people would have jumped all over it. So yes, it did reduce the cost of the mirror, but that's only a small fraction of the cost of large telescopes. So an interesting footnote to you know the history of astronomy, um, but uh, not a replacement for the classical mirrors that are out there. So thank you. Thank you very much, Brad. Uh, could I ask you to uh, stop sharing your mm -hmm. uh, just about to do that video and if we just get everybody back on okay so liquid telescopes who knew and uh, <laughs> so uh, did you say the lidar uh, instrument is still working I th I, the last time I checked it, it was a, it, I admit it was a few years ago. It was it, it it may not it may not be now. And I think if you, there are a couple groups, I think there's a group in India, there's a group in Belgium, I think, that are still um, I don't know, let's say tinkering with uh, with liquid mirror telescopes. Uh, I admit, you know, I, when I moved on to the theory computational side of things, I. You know, I when I see something show up in the, the media, I'll sort of look on it, but I've not really kept close eye on developments. And I think really with Romano Bora retiring in Canada and my supervisor, Paul Hickson, retiring as well, um, sort of any 
the impetus that may have existed sort of uh, evaporated and no one is sort of picking up and, and run with them. Yeah, it's uh, the uh, thing about Mercury. I, I remember when I was doing my uh, O-level, which was the 16 uh, examination at the time, many years ago, uh, we actually made a, um, a basic motor with a, uh, a magnet and a... Uh, and a bit of wire and a, a bath of mercury and round and round it went and uh yeah i remember yep. pu i remember pushing balls of mercury around the mercury tray yeah one of the when you, you mentioned the motor it reminds me of that's another another story so this was i guess it would be you know this is pre 9 11 when when all this was going on um when i started on the project uh one of again one of my jobs my supervisor sent me out to bora's lab in in quebec and I was instructed to bring back a drive, the drive motor that was going to connect with this magnetic tape up to the, to the air bearing. Now the drive motor is, you know, kind of this, this sort of size thing. Um, when I came back, I, all I had was my carry on luggage. So I just, I just took this thing in my, in my carry on luggage. Um, it, it looked for all per intents and purposes, it looked like a bomb. There was just no other way to put it. You just, you just looked at this thing no one would have known what it was obviously you would never get it i would have been like strip searched and if if i'd ever tried something like this nowadays but you know I, it said you know take out if you've got a you know a, a camera or anything and i said well okay, i don't have a camera so i'm just going to leave it in my bag as it goes through the scanning device and yeah came out the other side they pulled me over and took out this thing that looks like a bomb and he said well what is this and oh it's a drive motor for a liquid mirror telescope Okay, go on. I know it's. You'd never obviously get, in a million years you'd never get away with that nowadays. But looking back on it, that was again one of those amusing things from a, a bygone era. I actually passed through Vancouver Airport last year with a telescope in my luggage, and I cringed as the customs officer squeezed it, and I could hear it cracking, <laughs> and it said, "What's this then?" And I could hear it. I could hear the casing no. deforming under his. Uh, his hands. Uh, it hasn't been the same since, but there you go. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I think Brad and I will stop our little uh, tete -a tete and we'll let you in as well. So, in our usual manner, if you've got a question, can you put a digital hand up, preferably? Otherwise, wave at me and I will nominate somebody. So, questions, please. Let's see if I go back to my grid. Not a single question. Okay, Andy Davey. Andy Davey, can you un can you unmute your microphone? That's a dangerous thing to say, isn't it? <laughs> okay, can Andy. You me, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yeah. E excellent talk, Brad. Really enjoyed it. Thank um, you. Just a couple of things I've, I've picked up on. We live in southern Spain, only about twenty kilometers, twenty miles from Cala Alto, so I know right. it quite well up there. But the the, re the other thing is. I'm a retired mining engineer and about six or seven kilometers from my house, I know where there's an abandoned cinnabar mine. <laughs> it was mined between 1852 and 1896 and it was a surface extraction. So when you're talking about $150,000 a pint or whatever it is, <laughs> yeah. might, might do some night shifts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you might have, you should have grabbed a, a little bit of cinnabar as a takeaway present there. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Andy. Somebody. Yes, thank you. Thank no, you. Uh, Tony Morris. There we go. Hey, Tony. Hi, Brad. A uh, couple of questions. Uh, one about the, you said there was a, a, to stop the air making the surface of the mercury yeah. ripple. So was that a kind of membrane you put across the top? Yeah, I mean, we didn't, we didn't bother doing it ourselves, but I know that, um, in fact, there are, there, are, there are people who have done this in the lab as part of their experiments. They're trying to classify and minimize all of the surface aberrations that could occur. So they basically, they just put a yeah, thin horizontal layer of mylar was a, a good one, just a thin layer of mylar over top, which traps the air inside. You let it spin long enough, the air is moving at the, the same rotation speed, if you like, as the, as the liquid. So you don't have any differential wind on the, on the surface. 
again, one of the many things that we never worried about with, with our own, but I know that Bora and again, the, the people who were doing the hardcore optics measurements, they were doing all these sorts of things inside the lab. Right. Okay. Thank you. What about uh, the, the temperature coefficients then of mercury? So how did that affect the shape of the mirror? Yeah. So you, you, at sort of the the temperatures that we're working, you know, the, the sorts of room temperatures that ex or temperatures that exist in Vancouver, you know, you don't have to worry. But you know, a few degrees fluctuation from beginning of night to middle of the night uh, doesn't make a, a big difference. I I don't remember how big the temperature change has to be before you have to worry about it. To be honest, uh, I know that at the level of sort of a five to ten degree variation, definitely not. It may be much larger. There are people who thought about building these. Uh, so Bora had, he's got a lot of good papers and a lot of crazy papers. Um, one of one of his crazy papers is in relation to building one of the, you know, 100 meter, 1000 meter on the moon, one of these really large ones. Um, now you have to start worrying about things like um, what the atmospheric pressure is, because then you can't do it with liquid mercury anymore because it evaporates too quickly that when you lower the atmospheric pressure so you have, you'd have to give some thought to, you know, what you did at sea level versus being at the top of a mountain in, in Chile or something. Um, I'm not, again, I, off the top of my head, I don't know what that level of atmospheric change would do to the, um, the evaporation timescale. It's, it's probably not huge. Um, yeah, so I, I, I suspect those are all in there, probably at a smaller level than some of the other aberrations that we talked about. And I, I do... I never even thought about the atmospheric pressure one. I, the temperature one I thought about very briefly, but then someone in, played with mercury in the labs and said, oh, no, you don't, I, you know, unless your temperature variation is you know, way larger than you're ever going to encounter um, observing in Vancouver, you don't have to worry about that. It's, good. it's a good question, though. I should quantify that in case I get asked that one again. Okay, thank you. That's a good one. Okay, uh, Trevor, Trevor Worrell. Still muted. That's it. I've got it. Yeah, I was trying to click the uh, image. Um, Brad, thanks for a really interesting presentation. Fascinating that. Um, as everybody gets onto YouTube now and again, uh, the you know source of all knowledge. There's a guy who stretched a mylar membrane across a shallow cylinder and then sealed the other end of the cylinder and put a vacuum behind it, and it pulled the mylar into a, yeah. um, a parabolic shape. Then he froze a thing with like um, an industrial foam yep. and he produced something that could quite easily burn a hole in a two, two by four. And I wonder whether there's any other types of um, uh, cheap sort of uh, mirror technology other than mercury based. Yeah, no, that's it's a really, it's someone had actually mentioned this one to me, um, I don't know, a few months ago. And it's one of these things I meant to go look up. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and look this up on YouTube now. Uh, yeah. Yeah, or, or send me the link, or send me an email or stick it in the chat or something. Will do, yeah. yeah. But um, the, the other thing that didn't spring to mind in terms of alternatives uh, was uh, using a, and this takes you into the realm of what could you do to open up more of the sky, for example. So you can't do it with normal liquid because, you yeah, know, like I said, if it, even if it's rotating, you point it, it just flows out, obviously. Um, but what you could do is if you had something that was a metallic fluid that was reflective and you had a, a very clever array of magnets behind that you could uh, adjust to. So if you decide, you know, you could still have a rotating liquid, but if you had clever magnets that could adjust on the fly to where you were pointing, you could maintain the shape. Now, you know, you, there are theoretical papers that have discussed this. I think the you know the the level of technology that would have to go into having a magnetic fluid that maintains a we call it a parabolic shape to you know a fraction of a wavelength using a grid of magnets you know behind uh, I think probably would be orders of magnitude more expensive than just building a glass mirror again but conceptually people had given some had given some thought to to doing this. Um, People had also thought about using, yeah, using flatter ones and change, changing the having a, a a flat surface, but changing the um, index of refraction as a function of position by again having some clever way of 
of doing this on the fly and that would be some way to to bend the light from different directions into a detector so it wouldn't require you to rotate it but you could still use a liquid but just have a varying index of refraction to adjust for wherever you wanted to point in the sky by taking the light from that direction and bending it to the place that you wanted to do it so there's you know these i think they're all conceptually possible and there probably are some people who are I don't know what the application would be outside of astronomy, but probably the cost involved in the technology is again, way more than a simple glass and aluminized mirror. Uh, that's sort of stretching my, stretching my limit of, of knowledge on the alternates to, um, to liquid mercury. Thank you very much. Thank you, Trevor. Sorry, I had to switch you off because we're getting some feedback from you. Okay, anybody got any other questions? I've not. Seen, oh, uh, Andy DV again. And I saw Gary down in the bottom. Going. Did I see Gary down at the bottom? Oh, we, we, don't I worry about it. Gary down at the bottom. <laughs> can can, you, can oh. you hear me? Yes, we can. So, this is probably a really stupid idea, but I'm going to put it anyway. You know, you said you, with it being liquid, you can only point it straight up. Has anybody thought of your form your liquid mirror in the vertical position? And then if you're somehow able to freeze it, you can then direct it like a normal telescope and then just, just form your, your mirror each time. Yeah, and you, cost. you could vary the, you know, you could change your F ratio depending on what you wanted yeah. on any given night sort of thing. Um, uh, yeah, I think you'd probably have to use a different, I, I can't remember what the, you know, I can't remember what the freezing point, if you like, of melting point of liquid mercury is, but I'm going to guess you'd have to freeze it really cold, right? Because that's, you know, we used to have thermometers that had mercury that could, would go down to whatever temperature. So I guess you'd have to really chill it to, yeah, to, yeah. to solidify it. Uh, but maybe some weird alloy. Um, well, like the one that I talked about, the uh, this gallium indium tin eutectic alloy, it solidifies at minus 20. So you could, you know, you could be using it at zero degrees. You don't have to chill it down 20 degrees mm -hmm. and it would solidify. And you could have a, an F2 one night, an F3 the next night, an F1.5, depending on what sort of field of view and things that you wanted. Um, yeah. So I think conceptually, yeah, I think, you know, theoretically it should work. I'm not sure. Probably weird thermal things happen if you try and cool it down too quickly and it probably would r ruin its figure. You'd probably have to cool it really slowly so that it maintains the figure or something. But that's way outside my, uh, <laughs> my area of expertise. It, it, it was just an idea. I'm glad it worked yeah. it out for him. <laughs> Thank you. No worries. Okay, uh, Gary, can you unmute? Good evening, Gary. Good evening, how are you? Fine, thank you. And your question? My question is, is uh, like, obviously, if you didn't go too big, you could use a sidereostat to track the stars, so you would then not have to worry about are, some yeah, exposure there are, time. Yeah, there are, there, are some, there are some sneaky ways that you can um, both minimize the star trails, but also, um, yeah, I, if you're willing to spend money, this is another, another thing that people, we, we'd actually gave a little bit of thought to, and I played with it just a tiny, tiny bit. You can, um, if you make a really clever corrector, uh, so we, this, we don't have a, you know, this isn't like a, um, you know, have a, we don't have a Newtonian focus or anything like that. It's just prime focus. So we kept it really simple, light comes down, bounces up and then the CCD sits up at, up at prime focus. And again, we track at the, at the side aerial, side aerial right now, you know, for what we were using that 20 arc, I, I can't remember how good our, how large our field of view really was, but 20 arc minutes was fine. You know, there's no corrector. There was nothing, nothing there. It just comes straight in. Um, there were some designs that people had given serious thought to if we built a, you know, 10 meter class, which at the time, you know, would have been bigger than anything. Uh, but, it, you know, a 10 meter class where you wanted to open up to at least say 20 degrees of the sky, plus or minus 10 of the zenith. You, you, you could design a very clever secondary, which would give you an actual, a field of view, which would be up to 20 degrees away from the zenith. So you could, you could have got sort of that, but the cost of that corrector was like, again, 50 times more than the 100 times more than the, the telescope itself and so you know I, I do do remember I played in some optical you know ray tracing software just playing around with it a, a little bit uh, 
but you know, I could have spent years working on this and just, you know, come up with a really clever novel thing that costs a hundred million pounds and, and people would say, well, great, but you know, we're not going to be doing that because we could build an entire telescope um, and observatory with instruments for the same price as that one corrector lens. But there, there were some clever people who did play around with ray tracing software and design correctors that would work and would open up a larger, much larger field of view for these telescopes. But yeah, just weren't financially viable, if you like. And, and a second question, if I can. Obviously, certainly for amateurs, we uh, are moving towards almost like look imaging, high frame rate exposures. Would, would that be, obviously the technology wouldn't have been around uh, 20 years ago, but but nowadays that would yeah. make a, a big difference yeah. to your collect your detector. Yeah, I think you're. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously this was just not something we'd even. Well, I didn't even know it, it even existed or not. I was more of a theoretician, really. But um, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about, and I think it would. Yeah, I think it would be a. It's it is the sort of thing that would work quite well, and maybe. Ex Make that a little more useful, maybe the the, the technique. That's actually, that's actually a really good point. Okay, that's, Gary. It's a good one. I'm going to save that one for a future talk as well. <laughs> that's actually that's good. Okay, uh, Peter Lloyd had a hand up, and I see that Mike Scollin has also got a question. Peter, have you got a question for me? I, well, have you got a question more, for Brad. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Brad. Yes, it, it was more of a comment on the question that um, Andy Deavy made about uh, adjusting your, your liquid and allowing it to freeze. You you talked a little bit about that with glass at the beginning yeah. of your talk, yeah. and I rather got the impression that when the thing freezes, you don't you don't keep the surface that that the differential contraction uh, means the surface is the wrong shape. Would that that be the case? I think if you cool, I think again, this is sort of, you know, you need to get some, someone like Roger Angel who designed the spin casting technique, but you know, they, when they cool down the, the oven, it, I mean, it's the sort of thing it cools down, but it takes, you know, weeks to cool down. So the glass is cooled down very, very slowly so that it, if you, if you cool it too quickly, then it, it bends, it cracks, it does weird things. So, um, but even so, the simple change of temperature might, I, I would assume, change the shape. Yes. So I think that that, I, I, so I, I, again, I don't know really the difference between if you're doing this with liquid mercury and cooled it down to minus 100, I don't, whatever temperature mercury solidifies that. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you, you know, if it responds differently, it's coefficient of thermal expansion and you'd have to compare that with glass to see what the difference is. Maybe you could do it quickly with mercury and it wouldn't be a problem. Um, whereas well, not, with not brass, mercury so much as gallium bats or, or something, or solder, you know, something that melts a little more easily. Yeah. Our chief yeah. elf tells us that uh, mercury freezes at minus 39 degrees Celsius. Minus 39 Celsius, okay. Oh. But he, he has been known to be wrong. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I had, so, no, I had no idea. I would have guessed it was lower, but that, I, yeah. There you are. Uh, Mike Scollin. Good uh, evening, hi. Mike. Good evening. Um, hi, Brad. Um, are hi. you comfortable with uh, schools contacting you directly as regards? Absolutely. Yep, please do. Yeah, I am. Um, I'll pass the details on to my granddaughter's school. Yes, do. Um, I get around, I think we've, we get around to maybe 40 or 50 schools and colleges throughout the year in a normal year this uh you know the last oh, four, four and a half months has been a little bit different i've done a few you know zoom style um things but uh that's probably the in terms of my work been the worst part of the the lockdown i've been able to keep you know the bit of teaching i'm doing interacting with my postgrad students and undergrads project students you know do a little bit of research here and there mostly all the admin but uh that's the thing I miss most is, you know, once or twice a week being head of department, I can ring fence the time to do the thing that I really like, which is working with schools and colleges and teachers, um, working with, you know, research interns, bringing the work experience kids in from anywhere from year nine through 13. These are the things that I miss the most during the, during the lockdown. But, you know, in, in the interim, you know, doing, doing things like this, um, 
you know, they, usually they, they might, they want to hear about aliens or how the universe will end. Or um, if it's, you know, year 12, 13 students, maybe it'll be about STEM careers and, and careers in physics and things like that. Um, and like I said, if it's young, pri young primary kids, then it might be, you know, top 10 favorite things in the, un you know, wonders of the universe or, you know, astronauts and life in space. So yeah, whatever the age cohort, they just contact me directly and uh, I will either digitally visit them or visit them, say, in the new year, whenever, whenever things get back to quote unquote normal. Pass your details on. Thank you. Please do. Yeah. Brad, thank you for a very interesting talk. I'd just like to ask everybody, can you join me in thanking Brad in our usual Mexican Swinton manner? <laughs> I want to thank you the same way. 